Food access continues to be an enormous issue in the midst of the COVID-19 pandemic, particularly in communities of color. Today, we are uh, privileged to be joined by Dr. Chris Paul, an assistant professor of public administration at North Carolina Central University. Yes, you heard that right, Chris Paul. Uh, <laughs> a professor at NCCU who has done uh, some groundbreaking research on uh, just what the numbers look like in terms of food access or the lack thereof and what it means uh, going forward for COVID-19 response in some of these vulnerable communities. So, Dr. Paul, uh, great to have you on today. Uh, thanks so much. It's great to be here, Mr. Carter. So tell us a little bit about this this survey, because this this touches on a couple of different issues and it's statewide. Even though NCCU is based in, in Durham, this is something that's statewide that measures Carolinians uh, talking about their level of food access. Can you can you share a little bit about that? Yeah, absolutely. Uh, you know, I mean, I think North Carolina Central University truly is central uh, to the state as a whole, and and I think part of our work uh, in the research community and uh, and the educational community is to ex make sure we're expanding that reach and reaching every corner of the state. Uh, from, from our base in Durham. And so this survey uh, is a rapid assessment of hunger in North Carolina and the food security situation during COVID. Uh, and it's part of a bigger project at NCCU, the Advanced Center on COVID-Related Disparities uh, that is studying the impact of COVID in, in North Carolina. Um, and it's a very, uh, you know, very troubling result that we found um, that overall 17% of the respondents uh, had not had adequate food in the past week. Uh, this is just last week, uh, November 17th to 22nd uh, in this year, 2020. And, um, and it's, you know, it's of course uh, particularly awful to hear about this at the holidays. Um, and, it, and so the survey really informs a lot of thinking about what we need to do to respond to these problems in North Carolina. Uh, and it also, uh, you know, very much is, is part of our overall work at NCCU to understand uh, how uh, communities in North Carolina, and particularly uh, minority and underserved communities, uh, are being impacted uh, by the coronavirus pandemic. Now, let's just put this into context. Uh, can you tell us how many people responded? And the assumption would be that this is just from people who responded. It may not encompass a healthy cross-section of the population. And this is in, in the context of food pantries, different nonprofits, other organizations trying to kick into overdrive food provision and food distribution programming, right? Yeah, that's a, that's a great question um, uh, uh, about what, you know, what, what are, who are we actually talking about here? Um, so this is, this is an internet-based survey for across the state of North Carolina. We had over 1,300 responses uh, from 97 of North Carolina's 100 counties. And so that, um, you know, that it's an internet-based survey. This means that people who are responding have internet access. Um, they have devices they can respond to surveys on. And yet, even with this group, they uh, are still experiencing hunger that are at some of the highest levels we've seen in North Carolina since the Great Recession. Um, and we uh, we used a this this type of survey is called a quota based sample survey, and so we established quotas based on North Carolina's demographics around race and ethnicity, income level, and then the geography uh, of the counties, uh, the so called county tiers we have in North Carolina of rural and urban economically distressed counties, uh, and this allows us to get a, a pretty broad look, particularly since we're reaching over a thousand people. Our target uh, was 1,500. We reached over 1,300 uh, people to, to see that uh, of this large number of respondents uh, representing a, a really great geographic diversity and demographics like the state of North Carolina, uh, you know, unfortunately across that group and, uh, you know, really high levels of, of problems from the, uh, from the coronavirus pandemic. This is part of a statewide effort that several of the public HBCUs are involved in in Carolina with federal support uh, to, to, to not only uh, address COVID infection rates and, and community spread, but then to create research and information about its impact. Can you talk a little bit about that collaborative effort among the institutions and yeah, North Carolina absolutely. Central specifically the world? Absolutely. Thanks um, for pointing out. It's a, you know, I think a, a really exciting moment um, for uh, not just NCCU, uh, but other uh, HBCUs in North Carolina. This funding came uh, from the North Carolina General Assembly as an appropriation and then uh, was 
uh, and these programs are being supported by uh, uh, by the North Carolina Policy Collaboratory, which is based at UNC Chapel Hill, um, uh, and is is overseeing the, these research programs and efforts. Um, and so each each university has a has a different approach. At NCCU, we have twelve projects, um, and then we're focused on nine uh, counties specifically in North Carolina, uh, primarily in Central North Carolina. Uh, in the the Charlotte and Triangle region, as well as uh, as well as two on the on the coast uh, in the east, um, and these uh, and so this focus uh, allows us to engage the broad uh, group of interdisciplinary researchers at NCCU across these projects, working on everything from uh, vaccine development through to questions like uh, my groups um, that I'm uh, part of with Dr. Uh, S. Nicole Diggs and. Uh, Dr. Doyan Lee, looking at the uh, other impacts of coronavirus. Of course, the disease is awful. We and we hear about that in this survey um, and how bad it's impacted the families in the survey. But it's also these impacts on people's well-being in terms of ability to connect with their family and neighbors, their ability to get the aid and they need, the ability to work. Um, all of those things uh, are huge impacts on people's uh, uh, livelihoods uh, and well-being that are outside of the direct impact of the disease. And then going forward, what do you think the, 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 the effects will be after the pandemic, right? So we're, we're talking about food access now. At some point, there's going to be a metric on healthcare. There's going to be a metric on, uh, you know, public funding to address some of these disparities, particularly in vulnerable communities. Is your, is your research or your team going to be looking at when this is over, especially because now and like we're, we're looking at, OK, what does the vaccine look like? How do you deploy that? Is there going to be ongoing research about those kind of resources and life after this? Because it seems like there, there would be some long term effects well after we, we've developed a way for people to, to just physically be OK. Hey, absolutely. Uh, I, and I really appreciate that question um, and attention. And that and that's where that's where we should all be is, you know, uh, Figuring a path through to uh, uh, to control COVID and and then how to, to to strengthen our communities and our society. Our survey specifically looks a lot at, at community well being uh, and and what uh, I research social capital and people's uh, ability to connect with their neighbors um, for uh, uh, to increase food security, to increase health, increase healthy behaviors. The the Accord program. Uh, a, a big under, a, a big focus of the research is to understand uh, people's willingness to get tested and then to get uh, vaccinated um, and engage in public health behaviors. And then our work is also, uh, we call it uh, the HOPE program, uh, which is focused on population and environmental health uh, in, uh, in North Carolina and so in our nine uh, target counties. And so with this program, uh, we plan to have a mobile food pantry um, and do nutritional uh, programming to support communities um, in the counties. We are also working uh, with health clinics uh, to enhance uh, their resources and their connectedness to other public health programs. And so it, it certainly fits into a broader set of work um, that, uh, you know, that will go long after the pandemic is over. And then just the final question, this is a personal point of period. So you're, you're the first most famous Chris Paul in North Carolina. We talked a little <laughs> bit about this before we got on the air. You talked about your restaurant game is on point because of that. What is it like on a, on a daily basis at this point to walk around with such a, with such a distinguished name that you in your own right have made popular? <laughs> but, but, there, but there's another guy in the state who also bears it, who's trying to put in some work as well. Well, uh, I, I must have been a little faster on the social media game if I'm not, uh, you know, definitely not on the court because I have a, a CJ Paul as my um, Instagram handle, um, and so uh, I, uh, um, I, you know, I feel feel lucky to to, to share that name, and it, you know, sometimes it, it gets a little extra attention on the first day of class um, until people realize I'm not very athletic. <laughs> well, you do an amazing work in, in, in important ways, man. And we appreciate what you're putting in on behalf of communities across North Carolina, uh, particularly in the Raleigh-Durham area. And we're just, we're just grateful uh, for the work that you and your team are doing. Chris Paul, uh, Professor at North Carolina Center of Public Administration, thank you again for your time today, man. Thank you so much. It was great to be here.